everyone. Good evening. Good to see you. Welcome to all of our uh, those in our Facebook family that's watching us, and good evening to you. And we'll just see some other folks that come out. Are y'all comfortable? It's a little. It's a little bit chilly, isn't it, in here? Is it all right? As long as you keep big coats on, you're okay. Um, so it's good to see you. Um, we uh, remember, of course, we look forward to seeing you Sunday morning uh, for our worship. If you didn't get one of our proposed uh, 2023 budgets, it's on the back of the communion table back there in the back. Um, and we'll have a, a brief business meeting uh, right after our worship service on Sunday morning for the adoption of our 2023 budget on that. So we'll have that. And... Miss Lauren and her brother will be playing special music this coming Sunday. So you want to definitely be here to hear that. So, yeah, you're playing the piano. Are you, are you playing the piano? And he's going to play the ch cello. Like J E L L O? <laughs> we look for, we're looking forward to him. We'll be praying for you. Uh, in that. So it's good to see each of you. Um, I talked to uh, Charlie Falzon. Uh, he and Millie weren't here Sunday, and he said they were in the emergency room about six hours Sunday. Millie has uh, uh, the flu, and of course she's on oxygen anyway, and so that's not a good thing for her, so we need to pray for uh, Millie and for her getting well. Hopefully I don't know if they'll be able to be here Sunday or not. Uh, emergency rooms are still packed. People are just laying around sick, uh, trying to get them in and stuff. So hospitals are backed up. Uh, so we want to pray for all those sick folks. Brian DePriest's brother had um, surgery this morning, uh, tumors removed from his brain. He has cancer there. They got everything except a little sliver, they said, in there, which is not good. But uh, he has cancer uh, spots on his lungs and things. They're going to treat with uh, uh, treat this at the brain with radiation, the body with uh, chemo and stuff. Um, he's 61 years old. Uh, lives in Joplin, so that's Brian's brother. So lift him up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, he's in, he uh, got out this afternoon. He's in recovery, and then we'll go into intensive care. Uh, his name is James. So uh, lift him up to the Lord and Millie, pray for them. Um, we have our prayer list that we continue lifting up everybody. Uh, but do you have someone tonight just in mentioning before we pray? A special need. Amy? Just my class readers are there. Darren, Darren, like, I feel like that's your class reader. Okay. And I've already shook your hand. No, we bumped. Uh, where's that stuff at back there? Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Helen. Uh, let me mention what she said. Nobody could hear her on the Facebook. Is Amy's praying for her classroom. She has uh, pre-K, pre three to five-year-olds classes for the school system. Uh, real Jeremy, pray for him. Helen. Oh, all right, Mr. Ralph, we'll be praying for you. I have a little procedure on the eye Friday morning, so I won't see you there. Uh, but we'll pray for you, dear brother, to get that better. At least it isn't the nose. I know that's been a really, he's had the other eye and the nose, so we'll pray for Ralph. Thank you. And Helen, it's good to see you here tonight. You've been feeling bad. Okay, someone else? Okay, co-worker of Jeannie's. Lord knows and having problems. Friday, um, Rick Fielding, is that right? Fielding, uh, will be having a memorial service here in memory of his wife, Patty, that passed away um, from four to six. Visitation here in the sanctuary, like a memorial service. Their funeral will actually be Saturday down in Cassville, down around there toward Ro uh, Rogers, Arkansas, I think. The burial stuff, the families are from that area. Um, so lift that family up. Rick came Sunday morning, sat over here and signed and worshiped with us. And I was glad to get a chance to meet him. So we'll be praying for that family. Phil and Jeannie are going to open and close for us at the church. And I appreciate it. But they've been friends uh, with Patty and 
Nim lives in the neighborhood there. Uh, so we'll keep them in our prayers. Um, the others that we have longstanding, you know, with folks that are sick, we got friends that watches us from Virginia, Bill and uh, Priscilla have COVID, getting over COVID. Uh, Deborah's brother, you know, had COVID and her mom, dad's been sick. Uh, Doug Watts, Jerry, different ones. Uh, pray for Ray at Springfield Villa. He just kind of down in the dumps, you know, sort of uh, lift him up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, continue praying for Brother Jim Holbrook. Uh, who else? Yes, Danny's got COVID. Charles and Danny both have COVID, getting over COVID. Uh, probably still has it, Danny White and Charles. And it's not good for Danny. She's, she's not in good health anyway. And uh, so we need to lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Um, who else real quick? We'll sing a few songs next Wednesday night. Something's going on next Wednesday night. What is it? You remember? Lord's Supper. Okay, yes, we'll have some Christmas songs and things and Lord have communion. So come in and that will be our service. We'll serve together and folks can watch us as we partake. Uh, I guess you have to get your own stuff if you're at home, you know, watching uh, to do that. And uh, be careful. Don't let me know what kind, what you're using now. Uh, uh, unleavened bread. I don't say anything else. <laughs> uh, but we appreciate folks that do watch us and they comment about why they catch us on YouTube and different things. So we're thankful uh, for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, dear Father, for blessing us tonight with your presence. Thank you for all that have shared with prayer concerns. And I know there's unspoken requests, Lord, laid upon hearts, and uh, you know what they are. And we just commit that to you and ask that your will be done, that you be glorified. We know that you don't want us doing anything that doesn't glorify you. And we pray that you'll forgive us of our sins. We pray especially right now for James as he's in recovery, uh, just from this brain surgery and things that he's gone through and, and that his body will strengthen and that the treatments will work for him. Bless uh, Brian and his family as they stand by his side. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Miss Deborah and choir folks that will come on up and sing. Boy, I like to feel over. I thought Phil was going to come up. I seen him move. I, yeah. You could yeah, do come it, on Phil. Up here, Phil. That's, it'll be your Christmas present to all of us. Well, hello, everybody. <clears throat> Good to see everybody tonight. Let's stand. We're going to sing a couple of Christmas hymns here. What child is this? What child is this who laid to rest on me?
We're going to try to get in all these out of the hymn book we can before Christmas. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, folks. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Judy, thank you for filling in for Miss Deborah, and I certainly thank Brother Jerry. Of course, he's not here tonight, but I've thanked him in person anyway for, for that. But thank you for filling in for us. You did a wonderful job, uh, the service that you all had. Uh, appreciate it so much. If you have your Bibles, open them to Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 6, as we continue in our Bible study um, in the book of Philippians, it, it's, it's pretty rich, isn't it? I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot. You know, we live by a lot of what we you know, see in Philippians, a lot of memory verse, a lot of things that kind of links us together to hold us together in our faith that's really encouraging. Well, as I mentioned closing last week, and I used a big word on you, kenosis. In the Greek form, the word kenosis, this is this verse um, is probably, there's no passage in the New Testament that has probably had more discussion uh, with theologians those that are trying to figure it out because, and we will delve into what it is. The word kenosis is emptying. So it gives you an idea. So what we have to figure out is, okay, as we look at this passage and dissect it here in this verse, is what, what do we see here, what Paul was talking about? Because it really gets into a theological perspective for us. And this is the question. Some say whether Jesus really was God, if he just man in flesh or whatever. So let's read the scripture there. We'll read the whole and then we'll pick up on the pieces. Who being, that's talking Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. As I said, there's scarcely any passage in the New Testament that probably gives more to discussion about, in this verse, breaking it down, the question of the divinity of Jesus as Savior. Paul regarded Jesus, the Redeemer, as being equal with God. If he was truly divine, then his consenting to become a man probably was one of the most remarkable acts of humiliation you know, that was coming. When you understand. So in Mark chapter 16, verse 12, Mark, in, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark applied to the, talking about the form that Jesus assumed after his resurrection, in which, if you remember, um, well, there's two accounts. One was talking about the two, the men he walked along, and then he ended up having a meal with, uh, the two men on the road to Emmaus. But Mark chapter 16, verse 12 talks about after the resurrection which he appeared to these two disciples on his way to Emmaus and it says this after that he appeared in another form unto two of them that is the question going into the word of the form is that when Jesus was in in the form look at the verse go back to verse six, uh, Philippians 2 6 uh, if you will, Greg, who being in the form of God, who just like God, whatever God was, whatever God looked like, Jesus looked like that, so did the Holy Spirit, so does the Holy Spirit to look like. So, looking at seeing how that Jesus could, and, and keep this in mind, and we have to remember this, and see, this is the thing of what people said, okay, so Jesus, the word properly means form, shape, bodily shape, whatever, beautiful form, there in this scripture we're looking at in Mark 16, 12, when he appeared in another form unto the two of them. It, it had to be so radiant, probably it was difficult for them to 
really discerned that it was him because they had a discussion. He talked with them, if you remember, all the different things. But when in verse 7 applies the appearance of saying Jesus took upon him another form, he had the form of God, took upon him another form, and that form he took upon himself was the form of a what? Servant. So that was the lowest condition of a servant or the lowest thing of what anyone, Jesus came down. And we know we read the Bible and say, you know, man is made lesser than the angels really, when it comes to it. You know, to say here we are in the lowest state of what we are, but yet Jesus chose in that form. The word can only have here really one or two meanings. One is that of splendor and majesty, glory referring to the honor which the Redeemer had. His power, Jesus' power, I'm speaking about, to work miracles to do. So, and the other thing, one was his splendor, glory, and majesty of what he was. The second was, was nature, or the essence of his being. Um, the Greek word used in fusus is nature, or usa is the, his being, his, the very being of himself, his existence to be. And... When you look at this and see that Christ, before the foundation of the world, was in the form of God. I'm going to give you a verse, Greg, if you, I'll, I'll throw it up here. Uh, John 17, 5. Gospel of John 17, 5. So, before the foundation of the world was, Jesus was in the form of God. We'll get our theology straight. We all agree there. Because he had the glory that the Father had before the, fa the world was. Look at it in verse uh, 5 of John chapter 17. It says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee when? Before the world was. So that ought to, that this, John chapter 17, by the way, is actually the Lord's prayer. It is the prayer that he prayed. In, in John chapter 17, this is the prayer that Jesus prayed to the Father. It was the prayer of the Lord. Now, we call the Lord's Prayer, of course, over in Matthew, it says, Our Father who art in heaven. You know, that was, this is where he taught us how to pray. It was the things, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so we call it you know, the Lord's Prayer, although it wasn't a prayer that he prayed himself to do it. But if you want to know and see a prayer, of course, you could go to the garden. Jesus prayed many different times, but we have the total essence of everything Jesus prayed. And here, as he's coming to the place of, of crucifixion, and he's praying to the Father, and he says there, Glorify thou with thine, me thy, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Uh, he was right there. Remember, in the beginning was God, you know, and then everything formed from that, you know, from, and even later in Genesis chapter 1, uh, uh, we read where it says, let us make man as a pl in a plural form to do that. When looking at, that is for the majesty, the splendor, that would be one thing of saying which, which I believe, but it could be both as we look at it because the word uh, second opinion is equivalent to nature, being that he is in the nature of God. And uh, he was in, with the existence that he was divine in all of those things. So some try to separate their thoughts about uh, Jesus in his humanity and in his divinity. And that is hard for many people to grab hold of. That, that's just one of the things that people can't seem to do. Uh, it's the verse six says, who being in the form of God and the form here refers to uh, something uh, before he became a man. And it was something from which he humbled himself, making himself of no reputation, the Bible says, or take it upon himself, the form of a servant. Um, he speaks in John 17, five of that glory, which he had with the father before and things. And I got to thinking as I was studying this and looking at that and, I said, you know, this is really something that the creator chose to take upon himself to become a part of his creation. 
If answering the question and saying, can God do anything? He can do anything he wants to, anytime he wants to, any way he wants to. Because he is God. But to see how amazing, how fantastic that is, is to think that he, you know, as God leaves, choose, comes down in his glory to do this. He didn't, he didn't go to school to learn how to be God. He was God. You know, that when we think that he wasn't afraid when he left that someone else was going to take his seat at the throne. There wasn't anybody. He wasn't. So when, when he uh, left, when, when the plan was of what had to happen, and do you know where all of this came into being? Genesis 3.15 you know, the seed of a woman would bruise the head of the serpent. After the sin that came in the garden, that God had a plan. There was no surprise to God that, that from that very time in, in, in the beginning, as it's looking, in, in creation, God gave man, and we do not know how many hundreds or how many thousands of years before Adam started actually aging, that they lived because... Adam wasn't born as a baby. Adam was created and made as a man, a full-grown man. So was Eve as a full-grown woman. Uh, and from that point, as mature adults, they had all the capabilities and everything that was there to be so, so in the flesh that God made them in the flesh. So here and then they were told to multiply. This was to multiply upon the earth and all the different things. That was told them to do before they fell in sin. So I think that I, I, I think we don't really know uh, actually what took place, how many children that they may have had in, in paradise, what, what, what all occurred there. We have the record of their sons after they fell in sin. We have the, the birth of those and the announcement, you know, of those sons. And, of course, uh, Cain kills uh, Abel, you know, Abel's, uh, uh, I guess, firstborn and Cain. And then, then later on, Seth is born. Um, and we have records of that. But we don't have the records of, of any occurrences of, of the time frame of how many years and all the different things within the Garden of Eden that uh, were people... Uh, so if, if cattle was multiplying and elephants and dinosaurs and, and the fish and the birds and air, all of God's creation that he told to multiply and everything was perfect in the garden and there was no weeds, it was all grass. You know, when everything was there, and I'm, saying, I'm saying that being flippant, uh, and fruits on the trees and stuff, they didn't have to till the ground. Everything was handed to them in paradise. There, there was a... There was no labor. It was like heaven. The only thing they need to do was worship God. They named the animals. They did the different things. They walked around and looked, and, and they fed off all the different things that was there. So that was humanity. So to think about, that's where it began. After sin had, and then God, when he found Adam and Eve hiding from him, is when he spoke to them, and a curse was placed upon them and upon the earth, and upon Lucifer, upon Satan. But the blessing and the answer to the curse would be the seed of a woman that would come forth, and this would be the redeemer. This would be the seed that would, God had reserved for himself that would be um, and would bruise the head of the serpent. And this is to do away with, it, with the new life beginning, which was, of course, we know as Jesus Christ. But we did not know until thousands of years later that when Jesus would leave his throne, as I um, recall that uh, wonderful song, uh, when I was thinking about it, it said he made, in verse 7, he made of himself no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. The creator becoming as like his created to come down. And you might think and wonder, well, how that, that's, and, and this is the question of the kenosis of where people's talking about, say, okay, so he relinquished, 
He emptied himself of everything, and he no longer is God, but he came down. He was born of woman. But remember, he had no earthly father. The miracle was is that as he came, he had no earthly father. It wasn't the fact just that Mary was was young birth, and it was prophesied there would be a young virgin. I'm sure all the young girls, not just the fact of that, but that she would bear forth a son. Isaiah depicting his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. We're celebrating that time coming up right now to celebrate Christmas. But when we look at that and see how fascinating that is, is that through the Holy Spirit that moved up on the angel pronounced that, that, that Mary uh, is impregnated and she therefore is with child and the great miracle of that and how that she had to go through a lot of embarrassment and things in her life and Joseph and all that family, the things that was happening. But here he is. But even as a little baby when he was born in the manger, listen to me, even born, he never relinquished the fact that he was God. He was one, never, never at any time uh, did he cease being 100% God or 100% man. Never at any time. Um. What did he empty himself of? He was willing to put off the form left, uh, the form of the creator, to put on the form of the created, and never relinquishing the fact that he was now God in the flesh. In fact, uh, that's what we read, and if you will, Greg, John chapter 1. You're probably right on top of it for me. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, and then verse 14. So, it says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And it says in the next verse, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In verse 14, I believe, Greg's what I'd have. And the Word, notice this, was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So the kenosis of what some people believe, and there's still some religions today and people that believe this, like, well, uh, let's say the cult Jehovah Witnesses, um, the uh, Mormons, uh, in different churches believe that Jesus was a prophet. Even the Jews believe that Jesus was a prophet, but that he was not the Son of God, that he was not divinity. Uh, even though they were looking for the Messiah, they did not accept him as being the Messiah. They had their own mind about what the Messiah was going to look like and what he was going to be. And I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of people disappointed when we go trying to put things together about how it's going to be this way or that way and all that's going to happen. Because it's going to happen exactly as God intends, dear friends, for it to happen. I'm talking about the end of time and the beginning of time, whatever that is, because he's the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, God is in control of all of that. But he, Jesus, self-imposed, and this is important to get this, in emptying himself, he self-imposed limitations upon himself while he was in the flesh. Okay, now the point of that. So he self-imposed limitations upon. It's not saying that he couldn't. He self-imposed limitations upon himself while he was in human flesh. Let me give you an example. Do you remember when they was nailing him to the cross? And what did he say? Think not when they when they captured him and, and was nailed him down and they had him down and put him nailed him to and he said, Think not that I could call and yes, they would come at his beck and call. I could do that. I could call 10,000 angels, legion of angels to come. But he didn't. They, they could have released it at that moment. It's like that song. You remember the song says, he left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny. So 
Remember before going to the cross how he did that. So he self-imposed himself to limit himself, even, even at the very point of, of, of like when the wilderness of temptation. Satan reminded him of his power. Why, well, you could catch it down, you'd not even hurt, you know, to God won't let a bone break in your body or whatever, like this no scripture. So all the different things are, you could turn this rock into bread, you're starving, you're hungry. You could do this or you could do that, you know. It's amazing what the devil knew, the partial parts of the scripture of what Jesus did. But Jesus self-imposed limitations upon himself because why? It was thus to fulfill he had to suffer. He, had, he came in humanity as the lowest servant of, of all the creation of whatever God had. And in doing that, uh, we see he divested himself as divine nature and perfections to hold back that. And he was tempted in all ways as we are, as the Bible says. Uh, he suffered. He felt pain. He, he hungered, he thirsted, just like we do. He had all the different things. That, he had anxiety that would come to a point to where his uh, uh, sweat would become, as, or his uh, tears or his sweat would become as great drops of blood in ang- anguish as he would battle here in his life. Um, so he, he would, you know, go through all those things. Um, and he bled when he was gouged with a knife or a spear. He bled just like we did. He was 100% man, but yet he was 100% God. And he did not, so for some that says that he was just man, and he died, he lived in history, and they reject his words, his teachings. They, they even reject the fact of his resurrection. You know, this is where they can't handle the resurrection. Yeah, they can admit he died, in history, but they can never agree. Those who believe Jesus, if this be true that Jesus is, that he emptied himself, then he relinquished his divinity, his Godhead of all that he was, became man, and he died as man, and that was it, and it was over. But thank God that he didn't. The Bible said he took upon himself the form of servant. He was made in the likeness of man, which was likeness, resemblance. Verse 8 And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of that cross. So uh, being found uh, in fashion as a man. When you saw him, they said, why, this is uh, the carpenter's son. Jesus, if you remember, had a physical uh, vocation. He was a carpenter. He built things. His stepfather was a, uh, a carpenter uh, who, Joseph, who adopted him, you know, claimed him as his own son. Uh, but yet when Jesus would say, they're teaching at the age of 12 in the temple, And when the family went off and left him, and they come back, and he said, don't you know, I must be about my father's business. But he wasn't talking about a carpenter at that point, about Joseph. He's talking about the heavenly father. So he never denounced the fact of his divinity, his deity, of whatever he was. And and even when sometimes asked, he said, said, art thou the Christ? And they was asking him, are you the anointed one? Christ is the word Christos, not Jesus' name. Jesus' name is a whole other thing that we'll look at here in just a moment. But that word rendered fashion or state, fashion of man or condition. He took upon himself all the attributes, as we discussed, and uh, the liabilities of what the human flesh did, of all those different things. So um, he became obedient. He humbled himself. He became obedient. Uh, Two different things. One thing you never see, Jesus was, he was always humble and he was always obedient. Uh, Who was he obedient to? He subject himself to the law of God, to God's will, to God's plan. He even asked when he prayed in the garden, not my will, but thy will be done, Father. He stuck to the plan. He didn't change the plan. Could he? 
He could have, but had he, it would have changed the plan for all of us. And we, we would be on a whole different route. I'd hate to know that I'd had to pay for my sins in order to get into heaven. Because I don't have enough to do that, do you? Uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to say that I deserve to get into God's heaven. Because uh, I stopped drinking, I stopped cussing, I stopped smoking. And, uh, and all the different things that are saying, I stopped this, I stopped that. Surely God loves me now. I'm trying to live a perfect life and a sinless life. No one in the flesh can live a sinless life. Because they already lied when they said they could or they thought they could. Can't do it. So he was obedient even unto death. As that is that when his life was terminated to do that. Even the death of the cross. The cross was the crucifixion which was the, for the most hardened criminals. You're talking about humility there. That Jesus like the thieves on the cross. That one was saying this man has done nothing. He even recognized it. But it was a drummed up case in a political affair that uh, the Gnostics, all that they, they pushed and served and uh, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they all got together because what happened is, is that when Jesus came, he, he, he brought in that unity of love and peace and focused people on God. And the way to get to God was through God's plan. And not your rituals and things. He never discounted the fact of the importance of church. But church must be about the father's business. My father's house must be called a house of what? Prayer. You know, when he drove out the money changers and the different ones. So Jesus never changed the plan. He stuck with what God had laid out and that he knew he was going across. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would die upon a tree. He would be crucified in Isaiah 53, you know, it was dealing with the fact of how he would suffer as a servant and things that he would do. So in verse 9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And I guess as a reward for the humiliation and the sufferings, the things that was going through, that it just really was appropriate when you look at this and understand it, because it says God has also highly exalted him. And if you want to, Greg, um, pull up uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Uh, here, there, there in verse 9, when we're looking at it, it says God highly exalted him. We'll leave that to go. But notice this in Matthew. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me. And Jesus, even though when he relinquished his throne, came down and was born in a lowly manger, took upon himself the form of a little baby. How vulnerable. I mean, they had, his family had, to, you know, he had to be protected, didn't he? The king was sought to put him uh, and killed, you remember, killed all all the, the male children that was born from a time period, Herod sent out to go out and to kill all of the kids because he heard there was another king that was born and he felt threatened for his throne and he sent out and demanded that they be put to death. And they dragged them out, they hunted them down. It was just like in the days of Pharaoh when Pharaoh was killing because he thought the Jews, the Hebrews were growing too much and began to kill all of the male uh, children. And that's how Moses ended up in, uh, as a basket case. Oh, no, excuse me. <laughs> oh, then you got that one right there. It just came to me. Uh, never really heard that before. But anyway, it, yeah, his uh, true mother puts him in a basket, and then the Pharaoh's daughter finds him. His life is spared. You know the story. So look at verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. When you look at the, the authority, the power, the dominion of all that was given to Jesus, that now God has relinquished to Jesus his son, who is now in charge. I've got coach right now. 
who better, who better to be in charge than someone who come down and lived among us and we rejected him? Who better knows when he walked among people and as they raised him to do and the things to do to see how he suffered, how he was treated, what they were saying to him as God in the flesh, the word became flesh. That now, because if you remember, there is the judgment seat of Christ in Revelation and there's the great white throne. And at the judgment seat of Christ, at that judgment seat, in that hall, in another area, it's going to be the judgment for all of the saved, of what they've done since they've been saved. Whether it's good or bad, or whatever's done. And we will be judged, and be rewards will be given out to the faithful. But my personal opinion, that will be the time of tears in heaven. Uh, that will need to be wiped away. Because we will also be able to see our failures. Uh, we'll see uh, the mistakes, the things we made as Christians. When is being that saying, only the truly saved will be there. But the white throne judgment is going to be the place, you know, where all the dead, hell and the sea is given up. All the unbelievers, the rich, the poor, all that comes to stand before that great white throne in that judgment. And the end of that is, is to be cast into the lake of fire. And the evidence of it will be the fact that their names are not written down in the Lamb's, Lamb's. Who is the Lamb? Oh, the Lamb of God. So your name's not written down in the Lamb of God. How do we get into heaven? The entry into heaven. The name. The, the Lamb is who? Jesus and Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. So when people try to avoid coming into heaven, when people say, yes, this is, yeah, but I, fi I find so many of us that who are supposed to be Christians that we get confused on so many issues within our life. And, you know, James says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And we'll talk, you know, sweet water, bitter water can't run from the same fountain. And you just can't, you know, this thing, so you got to get it right. You better know within your heart to know when it comes to this place. But there's one thing that says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and earth and under the earth. And... I think I told you, as I uh, close here this evening, I think I told you that of the lady, I, I guess she would have been, <clears throat> this kind of comes from the Puritans uh, that practiced every time they heard, and this lady, uh, I've forgotten her name now, um, at, when I was at First Baptist Church of Hindman, Kentucky, up in Knott County, Eastern Kentucky, where they had that big flood up there, you know, was talking up there. Um, that came in one night. I'd been over to the funeral home just across the street and walked back to the parsonage and walking up, and she had this bicycle, had tires like on it that thick, that wide, you know. I'm like, man, and stuff. But she was putting, and she had this havoc thing on, like the flying nun that just comes. She had this black garment on, and I almost say, you see something like that, and all at once pops up in front of you about 20 feet, and you're like, you know, and I mean, it did. It, 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 it made the hair tingle on my neck and, and everything else because totally unexpected. And uh, so I kind of got over my startle moment there and, and ended up um, uh, inviting her in the house. She was hungry. She'd been riding her bicycle and stuff. She was headed actually down in somewhere western Kentucky where there was a convent of people that were meeting Quaker-like uh, folks that lived uh, in a place. And uh, she actually ended up uh, staying with us the weekend, went to church with us on Sunday morning. And uh, I didn't know it, but we liked to wore her out. But uh, when we were singing it, we were singing that song, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And, and she literally, any time, if we were talking in the name of Jesus, was, and she used this scripture as her reference, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. 
And so every time she heard the name Jesus, she would curtsy. She would, she would do a, a curtsy. I couldn't fault her in that, but it's a misinterpretation of what that scripture means. It is in, in the sense of honoring of God that, that when she was doing that, that was, I mean, I mean, she would open up her Bible and say, would you like to have a glass of water? And she would open her Bible up. God says, I can have it. You know, she was doing, and she got really eccentric. Um, and uh, the story on her after, when I found out later on was, is that she was um, uh, in the olden days of the hippie movement and stuff and a school teacher and uh, had a mental breakdown. Her family had put her into a place and she got out and I guess, but she got focused on, and, and my own sister kind of went through something like that. Just became just really um, with a, a breakdown, just had things. And she, she thought one time she was my sister, thinking she was uh, the Virgin Mary that had recarnated back. And then she was like, I, God, she would speak, write me letters that she was, uh, you know, people, you know, you can't, if you're not careful, you can get, you, know, you can lose your mind in things and, and not think clear. That's why the Bible says, we discussed that in chapter one. Let this mind, remember, we're talking about what we look at in chapter two. It talks about the character of the Christian here, of what we are as believers. You know, is let this mind, which is in Christ Jesus, be in you. This kind of mind in, in, in Jesus. So when that lady um, would think that, or my sister with different things, and my sister died when she was about 47 in her sleep uh, of a heart attack and stuff, and she probably went from being a 130 pounds to... Uh, going through with the medications and mental wards and stuff, going to 300 pounds, uh, just, uh, I don't know, just Dosa spent over half a million dollars of her estate and stuff that she had. She was quite well-to-do and stuff. It was a sad story. It broke my heart. But nobody could tell. You couldn't do anything. The court system would enter in. The lawyers got most of the money to become guardians for her and stuff to do it. But, you know, that's the thing that can happen. You don't know how quick. You know, that happened fairly quick within her life. You know, there was little signs and stuff. And I'm sure the lady that left up in Pennsylvania and come down through our way and was headed down to Western Kentucky and the havoc thing was doing when she was escaping from her family and looking the place to go. Yes, the place to run to is Jesus Christ. But, you see, if you, get, if you, if you don't have in your mind... To fix because the word of God tells us and we can understand what how we ought to live and, and all about God and what God is saying. But then when you start feeling that you're more special than anybody else and you get caught up into all the different things, extremes, you're more privileged. You know, it's so easy for us to do that, is it not? It's to do it. And we find ourselves doing it because here, what it is, is that when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess, when we come to this place of understanding here, is this is the repentant heart and the heart of worship, that when we come before God, that yes, we ought to bow in reverence and honor to him, but there's no evidence anywhere throughout the Bible as to actually uh, bowing every time like this lady did or saying that we do uh, at the name of Jesus. They didn't in the Bible. Uh, when they mentioned the name of his disciples or apostles, Jesus didn't. So this was things, um, when it's saying of things, it's not things, but it's beings. The word things is beings. The beings, the creation up in heaven, the beings upon the earth. Things can't bow down. Beings can. And the angels up in heaven worship and beings under the earth to think about the whole universe shall confess that Jesus is Lord. The very thing that they refuse to do right now is that, that at that day, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. And that's verse 11. It says, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory, and this is the reason to the glory of the Father. So that is everyone should acknowledge him. I wrote down John 14, 9, 
uh, says, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. How can he do that? Because he lived and he died and he lives again. He revived. He, he proved to us in, in the resurrection. It denotes his ownership, his rulership, his sovereignty is that he arose so that we know there is life after death. And Brother Ray was telling me at the first time the other day, there was a man that was arguing there with him. Ray, Ray's a good witness for the Lord, let me tell you. If you don't know Ray McNabb, buddy, uh, Ray will find out if you're saved or not. Uh, he'll, he'll just plain out ask you if you're saved. I like that. I said, he said he wanted, he'd, he'd like to go visiting. When I first said he wanted to go visiting, let's go talk to some people about Jesus, you know, do it. But he had this guy up there, and the guy said, the guy, I think he actually has, is in the uh, Springfield Villa, and he has part ownership of that villa, apparently. And he's saying, there is no man that has ever lived after, uh, when dying. No man. And I said, well, Ray, you know, and you can't argue with somebody if they don't believe the Bible, if they don't believe the story to know it. And, you know, and if they don't, I'm looking forward to going preaching, by the way, in January up there. And uh, Ray's going to drag that guy in there. Ray's big enough to do it. And uh, he'll just grab his wheelchair and push him in there, I guess. But, uh, it did, but that guy's in coming. But I'm looking forward to that because when it's saying, if you don't believe the Bible, of course, there's no hope. You can't believe the word of God. But like the song says, he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You know, how do I know? He lives within my heart. You know, you know that. You know the resurrection of Christ through that. So, thank you. Any questions before we go tonight? I want to thank everybody for joining and coming for our Bible study. And we'll look forward to seeing you. Communion, Brian, next week now. Uh, folks, uh, we'll, Deborah will have some good singing, Lauren, you know, Christmas songs, and we'll have a quiet time of worshiping the Lord in communion and thanking him for shedding his blood for us. And then the following Sunday, we'll look forward to celebrating his birth together. Thank you so much for coming.